If you haven't been to our sessions yet, Rescue, we are a behavior change marketing company. We focus exclusively on behavior change marketing, uh, providing research strategy and actual marketing services. There's about 37 of us spread around the country in four offices and also some uh, satellite folks. I come from the San Diego office, um, but we have people here uh, in this room today from all four of our offices. And um, our programs are also spread out around the country. We work directly with local and state health departments. Um, so they contract us to come and implement youth engagement programs. And then we have our youth action coordinators who are um, our, our staff locally in all those communities who actually run these programs on behalf of our clients. Um, and uh, we recently found out that we are also gonna be one of the FDA's marketing contractors for all of their, their new campaigns that are gonna be coming out. So we're really excited about that. Um, so one thing you may have noticed if you came to our booth, if you've seen one of our other sessions, um, you'll know that we have three different behavior change models because we think that there's different ways to cause behavior change and we shouldn't try and do them all with the same programs. So um, in some cases, we need to change knowledge and usually that's achieved by mass media campaigns and uh, you know, with TV commercials and things like that. Uh, sometimes we need to change policy. Um, and then sometimes we need to change culture, which is often achieved by going to events and, and uh, you know, really finding cool influencers and things like that. But what we're going to talk about today is actually our approach to changing policy. Um, so Evolvement is our approach to uh, youth engagement in policy change. And the Evolvement model, um, the, the unique thing about Evolvement, you know, we did, obviously we did not create youth engagement. It is uh, our sometimes called youth empowerment. It has been around for, for a long time. Um, it is, uh, the CDC actually has put out a guide on you know, best practices for youth empowerment and, and all sorts of things. So, so there's a lot of youth empowerment out there. But what's, what's different about what we do is that we have a very specific model about how it is that we ensure that no matter what youth want to do, no matter what they think up in all their creative glory, that it contributes tangibly to a policy change outcome. Okay? So, so this is the innovation here, and, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that works. The evolvement model, no matter what campaign we're doing, where in the country we are, or what the policy is, and we don't only work on tobacco, we've also worked on obesity and, um, and alcohol-related policies, so it, it expands any kind of health policy change. Uh, it is divided into campaigns, measures of progress, youth projects, and events. And I'm going to explain each of those uh, individually for you. The first one is what we call the branded campaign. So Evolvement is our movement, right? All of the youth join Evolvement. They are members of Evolvement, or sometimes we have um, different brand names for them, like Y Street is a, a program that's based on our Evolvement model. So they join the Evolvement movement. Then they work on a campaign. And the campaign, even though Evolvement is shared amongst our clients, so they all kind of benefit from sharing the same website, same marketing materials, they don't have to pay to recreate, you know, reinvent the wheel, share all that cost. But then the campaigns are specific to each one of our clients' initiatives. So if one of our, camp uh, one of our clients is working on excise tax or working on 24-7 smoke-free schools or smoke-free parks, uh, multi-unit housing, whatever it is that they're working on, we work with them to develop a, a campaign that's specific to their initiative. And our campaign has to have a policy change issue. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be changing a law. Sometimes it is corporate policy change. So for example, trying to convince Rolling Stone to stop accepting you know, tobacco advertising, you know, that to us is also a policy change. Um, so, so it's a very broad definition of policy change. Um, and it's organized into a campaign with an appealing brand. Now here's the unique thing about the brand. Evolvement is our youth brand. But our policy change brand is not for youth. It's for the general public, it's for voters, it's for adults, it's for parents, it's for everybody. So the brands that we make for these campaigns are for the general audience, all right? And then they have smart objectives. Um, and so what that means is that every one of our objectives you know, can be achieved, it's tangible, we have timelines to it, um, it's something that a young person can understand, like hey, in the next you know, year, in the next two years, we are working towards achieving this specific outcome. And that's very important that they're specific because we don't just want to say, oh, we're going to rid the world of tobacco use. That's not specific enough. What is the policy change that we're working on? What is the time frame that we're looking to achieve that policy change with? And in what and how are we going to achieve it? So for each of these um, objectives that we've developed, we then identify what we call measures of progress. And if you're going to remember any one thing about the presentation today, this is the one thing to remember. This is the one thing that changes a youth program that just has a whole bunch of youth sitting around for two years planning a single event and changes it to youth that are doing things 
every week, every day, constantly contributing to a ta tangibly to a policy change. It is this that makes the difference. Measures of progress are tangible and quantifiable indicators of progress uh, that I uh, identified and implemented to achieve your SMART objectives, such as petition signatures, support statements, and surveys. So they're actual things that youth can, can complete, can collect, can work on, that we know will achieve our goal. We don't know how many it'll take, but we know that every single one gets us closer. Whether it's a survey to prove to the press and prove to our community that this is a problem, or a petition to show how many people support this, a video testimonial to show personal stories of real constituents that are affected by this issue. Whatever it is, we know that every single one of these items is tangible and is going to help us achieve our goal. This, establishing this for every single campaign changes everything. Makes everything much easier to work on. Now, the way that we actually work with youth is, it, youth is also another innovation. We work with mini grantees. Now, uh, many of you have probably worked with mini grantees as well. But the one unique difference here is that our mini grantees um, were, are not given money to do a tobacco prevention project. We reward them with a grant. So how it works is we go after, um, this is for high school students only, um, and we are also starting to work with colleges. Um, we go after existing youth or young adult organizations of any kind, like an FBLA, a DECA, NIH, Key Club, um, cheerleaders, uh, uh, sports teams, you know, whoever wants to do this and is an existing team of youth and has at least 25 members already recruited. We offer them grants ranging from $1,200 to $2,000 a year, depending on which state it is and, and what our budget looks like. And for these grants, um, all they have to do is give us access to their youth. They, these advisors, these folks, they don't have to submit a plan to us, they don't have to do a project, they don't have to do this event that they're gonna work on and they have to put a budget together, no. All they have to do is guarantee us that they are going to ensure 25 youth are gonna be present at the training that we're gonna come and do for them and that those youth are going to complete projects for us in collaboration with our youth action coordinators throughout the year. So each one of these mini grantees is not only responsible for those 25 youth, but then is responsible for achieving 20 completed projects by the end of the year, as well as one event. Um, and so how this works is our youth action coordinators actually work directly with their youth. So the, youth, so the existing adult advisor that's a part of these groups doesn't really have any additional things to do because of us. The only times we bother them is, uh, or ask for their assistance is just when like, a youth hasn't contacted us in two weeks and we're trying to close out a project or we're trying to do something and, and we really need them to you know, nudge them a little bit. Um, but otherwise, it's directly between our youth coordinators and, and the youth. Um, now, what this does this, this, uh, is it ensures that we achieve these goals because they actually don't get their mini grants until they complete their goals. So we split up our mini grants into milestones and we give it to them after the training, after 10 projects are complete, after an event is complete, and after the other 10 projects are complete. So they don't get any of their funds until they've achieved the goals for us. And that's only possible because these funds are a reward. They are not money to do our work. We handle all the materials, we do everything ourselves, so, so they don't need any money to do the work. And what that also means is that these clubs, which are doing all sorts of amazing stuff on their own, going to their own conferences, going to their own competitions, and doing all these things, they're constantly fundraising and trying to do these things with their youth. This becomes a way for them to fundraise. So they see this as, okay, we're gonna do 10 less bake sales, and instead, work on tobacco prevention. And even though that's, you know, all, all of them, they might be focused on business or marketing or, you know, some, uh, uh, they might be future farmers of America. Uh, so it might not be necessarily their focus, but, what, but all of them have a community service component. All of them have, you know, civic uh, service as a part of their values, as a part of what they want to do. So it ends up fitting in with all of them. And the other great thing that we get is we get youth who are overachieving, are working hard, but may have never thought about tobacco prevention as something that they wanted to get involved in. So, so we expose all these potent leaders, they're all going to be leaders, um, so, but we expose them to tobacco prevention when they may have not otherwise been exposed to tobacco prevention. So this, this model really, really streamlines our, our, um, our management because we have existing student organizations um, oftentimes, our grantees end up recruiting, even though our requirement is that 20 show up, they end up recruiting over 50 who actually register with us online in advance to make sure that they get at least 25 at their training. 
Um, our training lasts four hours. Our youth action coordinators go to them, go to the school after school, and the training lasts about four hours. Um, and we, and our youth, and the way that the measures of progress are designed is actually for youth to lead these projects. So we've got a campaign, we've got measures of progress, and what we train the youth on is on what the issue is, how the measures of progress work and why they're important, and how to plan events and projects. Then it is up to them to do whatever it is they think will work in their community. So the empowerment, um, you know, we'll be the first to tell you that we don't, we don't think that empowerment means that youth have to do every single thing. I can tell you as a youth advocate myself that when I was 16 years old and volunteering at the Southern Nevada Health District in my anti-tobacco program, that sitting in a meeting planning a campaign for six months is the most boring, horrible thing I've ever done in my life. I don't want to do it. And youth today are the same. What do youth want to do? They want to get out there. They want to talk to people. They want to feel that they're contributing. They want to feel like they're doing something. They don't want to sit in, SO in uh, scope of work meetings. All right? That's for adults to do. So, um, and they will feel the pain later in life. But not yet. Let's spare them for a little while. Um, so, so what happens is because we have these MOPs in place, we figured out the boring part. We figured out the part that truly should be led by someone who understands policy change, who understands the community, you know, uh, how the community works, how um, politicians are thinking, and what will convince who, and what constituents we need to be targeting. You know, a youth is not going to know that. I mean, half of us don't even know that, right? We, we need to go and get an expert to know that. So that's who should be doing that. Once we have our strategy and our MOPs in place, then we empower the youth with that information so that they can figure out how to reach those people. Whether that means they're going to go to the county fair, they're going to do something at their school, they're going to go door to door to their neighbors, they're going to ask their parents to help them host something at their home, they're going to go and talk to this group or that group, it doesn't matter. Whatever they plan to do, it's totally up to them. The only thing that we require is that they set a goal of how many and which MOPs their project is going to complete. And what that does for the young person is it gives them a very clear sense of what success means. Success is not the fact that a youth did something for you. The success is a fact that the youth did something that contributed to your outcome. And that's something that we, we often overlook in tobacco. We're like, yeah, I got my youth to show up to this event. They all held signs. It was awesome. Did anyone talk to them? Did anyone see the signs? No, no. But they showed up. Success. No, that is not enough. We actually have to have what youth do contribute to our overall goals. So they put together their plans. They, um, they put together their plans for MOP, and if it doesn't work, they are the first to know. We don't even know, because they're out there doing their projects. So what did they end up doing? They improvise. They change their plan. They contact us. They say, okay, I only got 10 MOPs. My goal was 30, so I'm going to do this other thing, or I'm going to do that other thing to achieve my goal. Because they understand that the goal contributes to the outcome. They understand that each MOP contributes and that that's their key to success. And what else does it do? is for a young person who's volunteering for you, giving up their time, what do they want? They want to feel that their time is valuable and that their time is doing something tangible, that it's helping, that it's really, that it matters. And what better way to get instant gratification than to know that the way we measure success is MOPs and the MOPs are in your hand. So how are you going to make it happen? They find out that same day that what they did for you was not a waste of time, was not just you know, uh, you token, uh, you know, using youth as a token, it was actually contributing to change and they know exactly how much change they contributed to. So it's a really, really powerful concept that really makes, um, really makes evolvement completely different than a lot of the programs we've seen out there. Um, these are just some examples of youth in action. Um, you know, youth working on their own projects, you can see them here, uh, filling out some, some message cards here to legislators. Um, this was a, a display that they set up at, at a, a college. Um, so, you know, our youth in the community look a lot like any other youth engagement program. The difference is what they're actually doing and the outcomes that they're actually achieving. So, it's important to know kind of what involvement is and what involvement is not. We, um, not only myself, but a few of us at Rescue actually began our careers as youth advocates. We volunteered when, when we were in high school, and we kind of learned from the other end. And then we decided, hey, we need a little bit of innovations here. We need a little bit of work to do. So we decided to make this our careers. And what we've, so we've seen probably every single kind of youth engagement program there is. 
We've done half of them ourselves because this was not something that we thought up right away. It took a lot of work and a lot of trial and error. And this is what we are and what we're not. We are a lot of different groups of youth. We are not one core group of youth. Every single one of our grantees has active youth. We have, um, we have participation rates that at the end of the year range anywhere from 40 to 60% of our youth who were trained end up completing, fully completing a project, which means that they got their MOPs, they did the work. There's no such thing as a, as a core group of youth that do everything. Um, we have short, very focused trainings. We don't do large summits. I personally don't believe in large summits. I did them myself. The very first thing that I did in tobacco prevention is I was in a large summit. And I got glow sticks and t-shirts and woo! <laughs> it was not worth the money that was spent. Because what I needed to know was how to take action. And then I needed some resources after that big old summit to actually take action. So if your whole budget goes to that summit, what, what do I have? What do I have to work with? So we do very short, focused trainings at their site. We don't want to spend money on transportation. We don't want to spend money on venues and things like that. We just go to their school, go to their classroom, and we train them. And we ensure that we're going to groups that already have youth because we don't want to spend money on recruitment either. I can, I can tell you I have felt the pain of recruitment for you know, how exciting is it to promote an anti-tobacco training it is not. And I don't want to do another radio commercial or another you know, community event trying to recruit youth to my youth engagement program. There are so many youth already in programs, already looking for good things to do in their community that we just have to tap into. The next thing is we have very quick uh, rescue supported projects. We don't do long term projects. Youth have a lot going on. You know, we, we would be selfish to ask them to work on a project for six months. They can work on multiple projects. If they're excited, they can do another one and do another one. And, keep, and some of them do. Some of them are working on a project every month. But what we want to make sure is that the length of our project is equal to not only their, some of their attention spans, but also to their workload. They, they're a part of other clubs. They're a part of sports teams. They're a part of all this stuff. Why are we going to give them the, make our group a burden? We want them to feel immediately that they contributed and that if they want to contribute again, they can. And it's totally up to them. Um, we use existing groups of youth, as I've told you. Um, we don't have clubs. There's no such thing as an involvement club. Um, it's FBLA, it's DECA, it's NIH, it's Key Club, all of these existing clubs that, that we work with. And we focus on the, both the quality and the quantity of measures of progress for policy change. Our goal is not youth development. Youth development will happen because we are working directly with youth and we are empowering them to build projects and we're showing them how it works and we're doing all this. It's going to happen. But that is not the mission of this program. The mission of this program is to cause policy change, period. Okay? And I can't emphasize that enough. If you go to your funder and you tell them that we didn't reduce tobacco use, we didn't change policy, but our youth are developed now, it's like, well, great. Thank you for spending $10,000 per youth, which is often what ends up happening. Okay? That's not what our funds are for. Our funds are to reduce tobacco use, and we know that policy change does that, and so we've got to put that as number one. That's got to be our top goal. Um, how this is all supported is we have an online system that we use. Uh, it's called Helix. And we bu built Helix because you know, we're, our states are big that we work in. There's youth all over. We want to engage youth from rural areas. We want to engage youth from every corner of the state. And we just can't go out there very much. So um, Helix uh, is something that youth uh, can log into. This is an example of uh, the Y Street website, uh, which is a group that uses the evolvement model. Um, when youth log in, it kind of looks like a social network, kind of like what Facebook used to look like a little bit. Um, they can have friends, they can you know, talk to us, they can do all sorts of stuff, but more importantly, um, you know, here's their profile. Fun times, more importantly, they have a project management system. So what they do is they propose to us what kind of project they want to do. Um, we usually then may call them, talk to them online, do whatever it is to kind of clarify, clarify their goals. Um, if they're trying to do something that we know is just not going to go that well, we, we as kindly and as non-pushy as we can, try and you know, inspire them with other ideas, how to make it better. Because the last thing we want is a youth to fail. Um, we want them to feel good about their efforts. We want their time to go to something that's worthwhile. And so we work with them until their plan is approved. Once their plan is approved, um, they can actually report to us how their progress is going in terms of measures of progress. Um, so they do that, and they let us know the, their action plan and their steps and how all that is working. Uh, one of the really cool things is that because this is an online system, uh, we also have virtual MOPs. And so what those are are actual ads that they can post on Facebook and different places with a unique URL that allows us to track where traffic to the campaign website is coming from. 
So if, one, if, you, you know, if uh, Johnny here posts an ad, we can actually tell him how many people are clicking on his ads, uh, which is, for them is really cool because they feel like they're actual advertisers out there. Um, so that can, that's also an MOP that we track online. Um, Rescue offers youth incentives. And the incentives work with um, points. So every single MOP is worth a certain point value. And, and the more points that they collect, the higher their, their points are, and then there's an online store. And it works just like any other online store. They go shopping, they select what they want, they buy it, and it gets shipped to them. Um, because a lot of our youth end up working with us for a long time, there are small things, like you, know, you can see on there, there's a movie passes, a $25 Amex gift card, um, but there's also big things. There's right here, it's a $1,000 scholarship, there's a laptop sometimes, and how that works is it's, they save it over time. Some of them will stay with us for two or three years, saving their points, saving their points, and, and you know, they get that scholarship that they needed from us, or they, or they get that laptop that they needed from us. And, and for us, I know that that's, that's kind of hard for a government agency to say, hey, I'm gonna give away laptops. But when we really show that every single point is earned by a specific action, it's no different than hiring a consultant. You are paying them to do each thing. It is outcome oriented. It is not just giving away free things. You are, you are paying them. Um, and so, so we really position it that way for our clients because we really see that that's, that's what it is. No one gets anything for free with our programs. You gotta work for it. Um, on the adult side, uh, so, the, so our youth coordinators use this program to, to manage um, uh, the youth program. Uh, they have messaging system. Um, we have a task system that kind of lets us know when something needs to be done, when a youth needs to be responded to. Um, all of our youth man, all of our youth contacts and things like that are maintained online. Um, so we actually encourage our youth to change their information when it when it changes. So a lot of times we don't even know that a phone number changed because they already changed it before we even knew their phone number didn't work anymore. Um, and then our projects overview tells us exactly where projects are. Are they in the sign-up phase? Are they in the planning phase? Are they in the leading phase? Or our final phase is evaluation. Um, so each of our clients, they have certain questions that they like to ask their youth when the project is complete. You know, how did they go? What would you do better? How would you rate it? Things like that, just to kind of get a little bit of data out of every project. And so we customize those questions for them and ask them at the end of their projects. Um, and this is, I mentioned, the clicks. Uh, so this is how the, how the clicks look. So we count how many clicks we have from, from their ads. We also track how many come from unique computers. So we know how many, hopefully how many unique people come and we'll probably give them different point values for each of those. And then we can actually track what the people do on our website who came from that youth. So usually if we do a survey, we'll also have an online version of the survey. If we do a message card, a testimonial, we'll also have an online version of the testimonial. So we can track and we can say, hey, you know, you're getting hundreds of clicks but no one's doing anything. Can you encourage people, you know, when you're promoting our site, to actually comment and to send the message and sign the petition? And so they can see, you know, are these just clicks or are they actually turning into action that is supporting the policy change outcome? So we might say, you know, a click is worth one point, a unique click is worth two points, but a comment's worth 10 points. So they know that, hey, this is the goal, this is what we really want is those comments, those surveys, those petitions, whatever it is we're recruiting. So let me give you a few quick examples of what this looks like and how it works. Um, y Street is our, our oldest and uh, uh, pioneering model that, um, or program that uses the evolvement model. Um, it is through Y Street and the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth that we've really been able to develop a lot of these innovations. Um, so we really uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be here without those. Um, it was launched in 2004 and I'll tell you right now, it was launched nothing like this. It was launched as we were doing regional trainings, we were doing radio ads to recruit youth for these trainings, we were trying to get 100, 200 people there, um, we were pulling our hairs out when we weren't getting the numbers we wanted, and then we weren't really sure how youth were volunteering, so it ended up turning into youth just kind of showing up because they wanted to get in for free to some event, and it was, it was a mess. It was a mess, and it was not completing what we wanted. But if I looked around and if we just stopped right there and said, well, this is kind of what everyone else is doing, so we're probably okay, you know, we would have never gotten to where we are now. We, we knew that that was not good enough. And so over five, six years of working with Y Street, we said we need to change, this needs to be tangible, we need to cut our costs for recruitment, we can't be spending half of our budget on trying to get kids to actually join. And so over time, all of these little innovations came together until we ended up at the model that we're at today. And, um, and last year, uh, yeah, last year, 2011, uh, Y Street won the Group Youth Advocate of the Year Award, um, which was uh, really exciting from CTFK. So, so they felt like you know, it all came together. So what I want to do now is allow um, some of our youth to actually explain, quickly explain to you, you know, from their perspective, how it is that Y Street works.
Y Street is a youth-led advocacy group across the state of Virginia to get teens to live a healthier lifestyle. We're actually a hands-on movement. We collect surveys and we collect data and we raise awareness. One example of a survey we did was the FDA survey. The FDA put out 36 different graphic warning labels that could be potential labels for cigarette boxes. And Y Street took action and created surveys across Virginia to see which specific labels had the strongest reaction. And using these survey findings, we compiled a report and sent it to the FDA. The Meltdown campaign consisted of us comparing candy with tobacco products, the new smokeless ones. We handed out surveys to people all across Virginia and we just wanted their input just based on packaging, whether they thought it was a product for teenagers. The Y Street leadership team visited Virginia Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli and we made him aware of our findings. He was extremely shocked. He also was very supportive of what Y Street was doing. He was very supportive of our cause. We found out Kelly Clarkson was doing a show in Indonesia that was sponsored by a tobacco company and we set up the becauseofyoukelly.com website. We got over a thousand hits on the website and Hundreds of people left messages and eventually she did drop the sponsorship. We turned the website towards thanking her and saying that she was a great model and that we we're glad that she was supporting our cause. I feel great about that. <laughs> we are Wall Street! So pretty, pretty amazing youth and, um, and you know all of that that they just described, they did it in a single year. That's the other thing about this model is that once it's all streamlined, suddenly our staff time goes down, way down. A single youth action coordinator at Rescue manages 10 mini grantees, which means that they manage 250 youth, which equals about 200 projects per year through a single staff member. And that's because it's all streamlined. We're not doing meetings. We're not wasting time on conference calls. We're not having to drive around everywhere. It's all streamlined. It's online. We, visit, we see our youth probably twice a year. Our youth action coordinators definitely go for the training, and then they try and go for the event as well. Sometimes, you know, to support, they might go a third time. Um, but that's about it. The rest of the time, they're in the office mailing the MOPs to youth, receiving the MOPs back, calling them on the phone, texting them, doing whatever they need to, to get the work done. Um, before that year, uh, one of the first campaigns that Y Street worked on was called uh, 86 to Smoke, which was to help um, educate people about the, uh, the clean indoor air law that was um, currently being discussed in Virginia. And that's one of the things, you know, I, we are all aware that we cannot lobby, we cannot, you know, really push for, for policy change that hard. So everything is an educational campaign. And, and we make sure that we're never, you know, really crossing that lobbying line, even though we know in our hearts that what we really want to happen is that policy to change. But we know we can't quite say that, so it's always an educational campaign when we describe it to the public. Um, for this campaign, we did surveys, web ads, hold the, uh, hold the smoke statements, which were kind of uh, message cards, as well as video testimonials. Um, at the time, there were uh, four part-time co coordinators, which was equal to about two full-time coordinators, um, working on, uh, they did 14 trainings, the $2,000 grants, 11 grantees, and this is what these youth were able to achieve. So it was 377 trained youth. Um, they uh, had 310 projects were completed. 43 communities in Virginia were represented. Our staff is all located in Northern Virginia. And look at how far down that little corner of Virginia, that awkward piece down there, um, you know, how far down we're able to get. And that's because it's all online and it's all managed online. So we can really, we only have to go there once. That six hour, seven hour drive doesn't have to happen, you know, every month or anything like that. Um, they got 107 video testimonials of moms, dads, doctors, restaurant owners, all these people talking about how this uh, policy would affect them. Um, and their survey, uh, they collected almost 4,000 surveys that revealed that 93% um, of people would dine out more or just as often, and so we were able to use that as press releases and get, and get some media on it. And even though it wasn't a scientific study, the fact that it was all collected by young people throughout the state, you know, kind of, uh, for the press at least, um, offsets that. So they're like, all right, this wasn't scientific, but man, there's like 400 youth that are collecting these surveys, we gotta talk about it. And, and they end up talking about it. Um, they mentioned Meltdown on the video, and Meltdown was designed to educate the public about packaging and flavoring of new dis dissolvable products. One of the cool things about the model is because the model is so, um, so defined and every single community uses the same model, we're actually able to share campaigns as well. So um, after Y Street worked on Meltdown for a year, New Mexico actually uh, borrowed Meltdown. And they said, hey, we want to work on that too. Um, why don't we pay, you know, 20% of the cost of the campaign? And, and we're actually able to do that kind of work because, um, because our clients are willing to share, which I'm sure all of you are willing to share too. Um, but more importantly, because it's the same model. 
you know, they follow all the same parameters. So we had to update very little items to, to make it transferable to New Mexico. Um, and this year at uh, the FDA TIPSAC meeting, um, Y Street Youth were actually able to go to this, uh, you know, this really important meeting with, uh, you know, really, uh, um, and present their findings to scientists as well as representatives from the tobacco industry and be able to influence, you know, national policy that, that's going on. So they felt really, really um, um, good after doing that. And uh, we have a youth that might, might share a little bit of that experience with us. Um, so uh, this is what the meltdown surveys looked like. Where they were looking, asking people if they looked like candy, if they were confusing them for candy, uh, same with the flavors. Um, this is what the events look like. Um, so you can see youth are doing it in whatever different ways they want. You can see them mailing MOPs back to us, um, being out in the community doing their events. One really cool thing about this is that when we have big events like Kick Butts Day or National um, uh, All-American Smokeout, um, uh, Great American Smokeout, that, that's it, um, that you already know what to do. You know, you don't have to spend two months planning. What are we going to do for Kick Butts Day? No, let's just put an event together, put some MOP goals together, and just let our youth know this is a big day. We want to do a lot this day. And you already know what your goals are. And so it makes it really easy to just, you know, respond to these things that are constantly happening in the community. Um, they also collected uh, message stickers that were sent to magazines, letting them know that, you know, they don't appreciate, as young, young readers of their magazines, they don't appreciate the snooze ads that are constantly in those magazines. Um, these are the some of the online ads. And these are some of the outcomes. So um, in Virginia, there was uh, 356 trained youth that worked on this project. They completed 674 projects, producing nearly 19,000 measures of progress, which included 5,000 message, uh, messages to magazines, 8,000 surveys, 100 videos, and 5,700 web clicks. Um, in New Mexico, we had 145 trained youth working on this project who completed 155 projects, producing about 6,500 measures of progress, um, almost 6,000 surveys, and 500 messages to magazines. These numbers sound crazy until you know the model and until you know just how easy everyone's life becomes when we develop you know, a very clear and easy to understand model that everyone's working towards. And that's when we start to get these numbers that even the first year we did this, you know, we knew it was successful just from the numbers of things we were getting. We were like, wow, we are onto something tr truly unique. Um, and the last campaign I'm gonna show you uh, before we get to some questions is Counterbalance. And Counterbalance uh, did two things. Um, one of the things it's doing is it's doing uh, store assessments um, to help inform policy at the FDA. So, you know, uh, sometimes we can't change our state laws. Sometimes our clients are a little gun shy when it comes to uh, policy change. So we can always go towards uh, national campaigns, um, national policy. And, and that has, you know, is just as important and can cause an even bigger impact sometimes. So youth are doing store assessments um, and also, uh, m you know, determining the distance of stores from schools and other places where youth are. Um, and they're kind of taking pictures and rating if it's a lot of tobacco advertising, a medium amount or uh, a little bit, um, which is going to be put together in reports and sent to the FDA. Um, and before that, what you saw in the video was that they did a um, uh, surveys about the, the graphic warning labels. Now, a really interesting thing about this example is that this survey was put together probably two weeks after the FDA put out their call for, for public comment. We didn't know it was coming. You know, we, we just, we saw it. We said, they want it in two months. We can do this. Over the holiday, <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> and, and the nice thing about it is that because the model is already set up, Every youth knows how it works. They know what an MOP is. They know how to put together a project. All we have to do is make a little video, call our youth, say, hey, we've got this new thing. It's urgent. We're going to double the point value of these projects. So if you can work on it, work on it. And within six weeks, we had nearly 2,000 surveys. And we were able to submit that report on time you know, in the public comment, uh, which really just would be impossible if we didn't have this model and this online system in place. Um, and so what the youth found, uh, which you saw in the and it was things like this. We were able to uh, analyze the data from the youth and, and show what, what their findings were from their convenience sample. Um, and after being presenting at, at TIPSAC, they were also able to, they were also invited to attend um, the actual announcement of the graphic warning labels uh, with the Surgeon General. Um, so it was all really, really exciting for them and, and really cool. And this is actually the last one. So the last campaign um, that we have is from uh, New Mexico, uh, which is a campaign they're working on right now called In the Clear, which is all about um, uh, smoke-free homes and cars um, and even talking about you know kind of multi-unit housing and, and how can we get involved in um, in helping people make these environments smoke-free especially if they're parents so this is the survey that youth are working on 
to try and give the state a good assessment of you know, how many people this would influence, uh, how many people are currently allowing smoking in their cars, what knowledge do they have of secondhand smoke, because we want to understand what is it that people need to know in order to know it's important to reduce uh, smoking. And then there's also uh, pledges. So we're trying to get folks to pledge to make their cars smoke free, to make their homes smoke free, things like that. And, um, and youth are so amazing that they've actually been able to get some very high profile pledges. Um, a few mayors, uh, including the mayor of Albuquerque, has been able to sign a pledge um, from a youth going up to them and saying, hey, will you sign my pledge? So um, it's really, really exciting everything that youth have been able to achieve. Um, so before we get to questions and discussion, um, and just so everyone knows, our, our next session is poster sessions. So if you absolutely have to go to your poster right when it starts, um, you know, now is the time. But we're going to go probably 10 more minutes, uh, and you'll still have plenty of time to roam the posters. Um, but I'm actually going to invite some of our youth that are here with us today um, to tell us a little bit from their experience. Um, so if you guys will please uh, welcome Natani, Judy, and Blaine. Come on up. We've got chairs for you. And um, I'm also going to ask uh, Sony, uh, who is our um, youth engagement specialist uh, and works with uh, all of these youth, to sit down. So um, you guys will be able to ask them questions too. I, I want to just kind of get the ball rolling and, and um, ask you guys. Um, so Natani, uh, how would you say, and, and don't forget to press that button there. Well, we'll figure it out. Um, so from your perspective, how do you know, the measures of progress and kind of the, the structure of the campaign um, affect your work with Evolvement? Uh, the, the MLPs make it, make it really easy to work towards um, the goal we're shooting for. And it's like tangible, quantifiable. Um, it's, it makes it more real to us. Like, you know, we're collecting these things and we see how much we collect. And, we're submitting them to them for this data collection. And it's really neat that it's all organized in that way because as a teen, we're focused on our high school education and trying to get it into college and you know our other extracurricular and curricular activities, you know, athletics, things like that. Um, so we're busy too. And to have this structure down and established, it makes things really clear and really easy um, for us to do work as youth advocates. And it's really great. Cool. Um, Blaine, uh, and so Natani's from New Mexico, and both Blaine and Judy are from Virginia, from Y Street. Um, so Blaine, how, um, you know, we're, we're kind of, we've defined a lot with, uh, with Evolvement and Y Street. We define the measures of progress and things like that. So are you still able to be creative? You know, are you able to do whatever you think up, uh, even though we have this structure in place? Yeah, um, well, with my particular case, we were a mini grant program, so um, it's part of our requirement to have a project day. So, um, and I wanted to do a personal project day as well and go above and beyond and get my points in the point store. Um, so, I came up with the idea to piggyback off of the East Coast Surfing Championship. So, I called up my um, coordinator, Eugene, at the time, and um, was like, hey, like, I need projects, I need you, like, come out, I want to get all these done and, like, talk to the surfers, like, get their opinion. I think it's a really cool, like, demographic. Being from Virginia Beach, it's, like, all we know, basically. So, um, it was really, really exciting. So, I got to, like, plan it with Jack's help, or I'm sorry, with Eugene's help, and um, it was really, really successful. It was a great time. So, cool. Yeah. Um, and Judy, um, so we've, I've told the audience boldly that youth um, development is not mm. our goal because it will happen. So from your perspective, you know, what, are, what happened to you during Y Street that you think contributed to your success now? Yeah, I think Y Street has played a huge role in my success as a youth advocate and even as a teenager. To be honest, when I started Y Street, I saw it as being a good way to get active and have to have some fun, but not to really have that much of a time investment in it. But as I moved on, I started seeing that Y Street provides you with so many different opportunities just if you take the initiative and grab these opportunities that come towards you. So with Y Street, I was able to go out into my community and really get comfortable with talking to people that I wasn't used to talking to, get comfortable with fighting for something that I was really passionate about. And it's really given me the opportunity to go out into public places to, like um, Jeff mentioned, testify before a TIPSAC meeting, which was a huge deal, to talk to my attorney general, talk to senators, things that most teenagers would not have the opportunity to do. But just as a teen who is involved with Y Street, you know, to be able to have a voice as a minor, I think, was a huge deal, and it's definitely helped me to develop my leadership skills and also to continue to fight for something that I think is really a huge issue in our world right now. 
And um, all, all of these youth are part of their respective uh, youth leadership teams. So even though we don't have a core team, everyone's working on projects, we do have more of a consulting youth team, youth leadership team, where they do come together um, uh, once or twice a year in a kind of small summit format and mm -hmm. help us work on the campaigns that we're gonna work on the next year. But that usually doesn't start until about a year after we've started involvement because we wanna know that these are youth who understand the process, who are passionate about this, who know how to do the work, and uh, we want them to earn those slots. So they've, they've, all they've all been part of those leadership teams and have helped you know, shape a lot of these campaigns. And so the last question I'll ask is, is for Sony, who is um, you know, in the trenches of youth engagement for us, um, and also ends up talking to a lot of other youth engagement programs, to CTFK, um, uh, all the time. So what would you say are you know, one or some of the big differences between this and the other things that you see out there? Um, one of the big differences in what we do is just the relevancy factor, not only for the topics that the youth are pursuing when it comes to tobacco control, but also how relevant they feel in the successes that we have. So like Jeff's been mentioning, the quantifiable piece is a really important part of it. Um, I think Natani brought that up as well. When they're going out there um, and they're talking to folks in their schools and communities about these topics, it's not just creating awareness and leaving it at that. They can really count um, you know, down to the survey or down to the video testimonial, what they've done to contribute toward some type of success. Um, whether that's something that is in their community that happens or all the way up to like FDA regulation, which is what, um, what we like working on as well. They can look back after their high school careers are over, you know, when they're hanging out later on, their college friends, yeah, I was part of Y Street, this is what I did. Um, I'm sure all of us at some point were in a high school club. Um, I was in the Earth Club when I was in high school and we picked up trash one time. You know, that's what I did. Um, these kids, when they, you know, go on to Stanford and to Princeton and wherever Blaine ends up, when they're talking about their time in tobacco advocacy, imagine the things they get to say. And it's not just stuff that, you know, to build them up. Obviously, we love building them up because we love doing that with our youth. Um, but it's something that's relevant. You know, they've all contributed to policy change, whether that's um, something that is local or state or, you know, federal. And that's something they can carry with them. And obviously, like Jeff mentioned, those skills, those soft skills, which I'm a big fan of, um, come naturally when you're doing something like the model that we use. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, well, let's give them a hand real quick. And um, I want to open up the floor to questions for me, questions for any of our youth or for Sony. Yes. Right, um, so we, we rely a little bit on our clients for that help. So our specialty is how to bring you together, how to design these campaigns in collaboration with a policy change expert at these organizations. And so we kind of rely on them. We, we will consider us your army. And then we kind of turn to a member of our client's organization who's really in the know on the policy changes, working towards the policy change on their own to kind of give us guidance on what to do next. Um, we don't, we don't profess to be you know, experts on policy change, that, that's not what our business is, we're youth experts. And so we look to them to say, for them to tell us like, hey, I need more message cards from this uh, um, you know, area, from these constituents. I need video testimonials. I need, um, I, I need all this stuff by this day because I have a session with, with these folks. I need five awesome youth to come and present at a city council meeting or to come to the state with me. Um, so we really count on that person. They don't have to worry about, is it going to happen or not? We worry about that. We will make it happen. Our, your army of youth will make this happen. We just need you to kind of give us guidance on what you need to make that change happen. So, so th does that make sense? Right. Right. So, well, sometimes the outcome is is simply submitting something, for example, to the FDA. You know, if if we can't. Um, you know, we've worked on excise tax and we've worked on things that are uh, a little bit, um, there are, they are pretty difficult to achieve. So sometimes we're just kind of working towards, let's get as far as we can, as far as our policy change person can get to, and, um, and, and that's how far we can get. But sometimes we're giving it to someone who's going to continue working on the policy change. Um, for example, 
Um, the FDA, whose uh, director is here, and can you tell us what? Officially, uh, and I mean, we were tremendously excited about that information. Our scientists, our behavioral scientists, and our regulatory specialists analyzed that information that was submitted and actually go and read the final regulation that was that that was the final FDA decision. And those results influenced what FDA did. Um, similarly, when Judy came and testified and gave the survey results from Virginia and, and New Mexico, that scientific advisory committee integrated those results into their recommendations to FDA. So it works. Yeah. yeah. That policy change is slow, but there's a lot of you know, successes along the way. And another um, organization a uh, client wants to talk from uh, New Mexico, this is Benny. Yeah, from New Mexico side. Um, you know, talked about uh, several campaigns. We already got a request from the American Cancer Society in New Mexico. We're going to be getting a new batch of uh, legislators in New Mexico in the state legislature. And what they're asking is, through through this group you're working with, they're, they're figuring out who they are. Um, they're saying, can we tap into this young group to be able to go and educate legislators on these issues? So there's a request for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> write it down. <laughs> Sony, get it down. The other one is on multi-unit housing. We're working with a variety of associations, you know, apartment associations, multi-unit housing associations in New Mexico, who are also going to need some education around uh, smoke-free policy, voluntary smoke-free policy. So we're going to be tapping into the involvement group to go educate them about this, you know. So and then there's another one on smoke-free patios in restaurants and bars where we're gonna hit these professional associations with education on the benefits of this policy change. So there's, there are some very specific things you can do with that. Yeah, and, and I think the, you know, the very first campaign that we did you know, had, a very, um, had a great success, which was that the um, Clean Indoor Air Bill in Virginia passed. Um, and that was after you know, nine months of working on educating the public. Um, you know, we had no lobbying or influence on that policy. Uh, but we did educate a whole lot, you know, to, to get there. And so, and, and got a lot of, you know, earned media and, and things like that along the way. So, so there are, you know, also some tangible actual, this policy changed. Um, and in, other policies tend to be, a, some are harder than others, so. Um, other questions? Yes. You said that you build upon other groups. The communities that I serve are smaller schools. So like our FCCLA chapter only has 12 members. Could they partnership with like the FBLA and do something like that? Do you want to take that? Absolutely, I mean we're looking more for not the influence of a particular after school club, but making sure that there's enough membership to where when we go into that community we can have at least 25 youth at that training. So we do work with groups where they've combined with other groups and we also keep it open. So just because we're working with let's say an FCCLA group um, doesn't mean that that can't be opened up then, you know, Y Street can still be with anyone in their school. They're just kind of our avenue into that school. The teacher becomes the main contact for us to kind of send things to or communicate with. They're also the ones who receive the grant funding. So it's in their best interest to recruit as many youth as they possibly can. And we do, um, we, uh, we send them promotional materials and posters and things. So sometimes they use it to recruit for their club. You know, hey, here's another reason to join our club. It's because we're working on this. And occasionally, if we are in a community that is just so small, it's impossible to get 25 members. Um, what our team has done is they've increased another goal. So they've said, okay, we'll allow you to have maybe 20 or 15 members, but you now have to have 10 more projects or something like that. So does your organization give information back to like say the, the state health department to do evaluation on the program or do you do evaluation yourselves? It's a, it's a mixture of, of the two. So, you know, we're not, it's hard to evaluate policy change uh, because the ultimate evaluation is that you change the policy. And, and we're very upfront with our clients about that, that hey, we are not preventing tobacco use. 
none of our members are smokers and none of them will probably ever be smokers. And, we're, and we know that. Um, and, and we're not really going around doing peer education. That's not our goal either. We're trying to change policy. So um, the measures of progress give us a tremendous amount of process evaluation. You know, they tell us how effective each of these groups are, how effective our specific employees are. Um, but the ultimate final evaluation is really, does a policy change? Does it get included in a report, in a recommendation? Does it, you know, what happens with it? Um, we are, we have evaluators that are different clients who are looking for ways to get even more evaluation um, and look into even more things, but really the ultimate item is that policy change. Yes. What are what are the kind of topics that work best when a client has a particular interest and then um, the youth are either more interested in doing that kind of thing or not? Are there cases where you have to translate what the interest of the client is that turn into MOPs? Sometimes it works well, the youth really want to do it, or other times not. What are the characteristics of both kinds of things? Um, what are some of the most interesting campaigns for you guys? Um, yeah. When I started with Y Street, um, we, Meltdown had already been enacted, um, and it was going really, really well, and so then I came into the, you know, I started with Y Street, and I have loved Meltdown so far, and I know it's closed, and it actually really, really bothers me. I wish we could keep going with it, but um, that was definitely, like, I, I just loved Meltdown. I thought it was great, and I love, I really do, like, like all of our campaigns. There hasn't been anything that I've been like, no, everything really is relevant, and I, I really, I mean, I find that I support it a lot, and my FBLA, fellow FBLA members um, that are in Y Street, we all, we all really do support it. I think it's great. Um, as part of the leadership team, you guys debate campaigns sometimes. Exactly. Have you come across campaigns that you were like, this is just not going to work? Um, yeah, actually, with the YSLT summit we just had, um, there was, um, what, how did it go? I'm sorry. Oh, okay, well then. Um, something was proposed, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly what, but um, we as Y Street leadership team, the 12, 13 of us, we didn't really agree with it, and so we, didn't, we decided not to do it. You know, it's just back to that creativity thing and the Y Street leadership team, it really is the leadership team. Um, one example I have is, uh, you know, kind of one of the recent uh, things has just been t smoking in movies, you know, Hollywood, smoking, all that. So a few years ago, it was something that had come up, and so we did a conference call with our leadership team, bringing this up as a topic, and we explained everything to them, and they were like really hesitant. Um, Judy, I don't know if you were on that call, but you know they were saying, well, if you know if they make all the all the movies with smoking rated R, I can't go see all these movies that all my friends are seeing, and you know there was there was a hesitancy there, and so we kind of backed up, and um, a few a few months later, we were able to revisit the topic and almost repackage it, not in a way that we were manipulating our youth, but in a way that they were able to really see the buy-in in that and really get some uh, really feel like that was something that they want to be a part of, and so what we we brought up, you know, G and PG rated movies that are made for kids, should those have smoking? in them and that was when the light bulb went off um, which was what we were saying months before but we weren't saying it in the right way so it really was about you know the topic was something that we did want to pursue it was something a few years ago was the National Day of Action topic um, and so on on the National Day of Action I think it was in 2010 or 2011 um, that was a topic so we wanted to make sure that Y Street was was implementing something for that day but of course we needed our youth to buy in on that so it was just a matter of rephrasing it or figuring out a way that makes it irrelevant topic so that our teenagers can really feel a part of the action. Yeah, and sometimes we ask, you know, for our clients, can you give us three options that you're really interested in? So that that way we can at least, if one doesn't really doesn't work, we have some options to work with. Um. Yeah, um, can I add to that real quick? Yeah. So one thing Sony mentioned was, you know, a lot of this is youth-led, and just another example, I know that sometimes we've had shorter projects that have actually had an overwhelming amount of support from our youth. So like we saw in the video, the Kelly Clarkson campaign, I know that youth saw that as being a huge issue and it was one that kind of just sprung up out of nowhere and then all of a sudden we had hundreds of people going towards one goal and within a couple of weeks we got thousands of hits on a website, thousands of people supporting this cause. So I feel like the youth really do have the ability to really spearhead a campaign that they think is particularly interesting at one point and particularly important. So that's one really great benefit of Y Street. And they didn't all like Kelly Clarkson, so, but they did all see the, you know, the influence that she had. So that was, that was a fun conference call that we had. Yeah, and, and I think that's a key point. You know, Kelly Clarkson, the times we sent messages to magazines, I think the closer the change is to their life and to what's happening, 
um, the more exciting it is because if they change something, it's something that their friends know about, that they can tell their friends about. And there is so much work to do with the entertainment industry. I mean, you know, Lady Gaga smoking on an award show, uh, Madonna re releasing videos with smoking in them. Um, we are so far behind on convincing Hollywood that smoking in any kind of imagery is a bad thing. Um, so there's a lot of work to do there, and that's just, that's that makes it even more exciting because it's just so close to your life. You know. Are there any other questions? Thank you guys for staying so long with us.